Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy with yet another debunking video. You know, lately we've been having a lot of problems with people understanding the use of a sextant. So I thought I would approach it from a slightly different way. So let's cue up the music and learn about the mill dot. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Springfield M1A. It is the civilian version of an M14, and it is used for long distance target shooting, or at least in my case it is. I can hit targets with this out to over 600 meters. Now, the reason that I brought it out today is I want to talk about this particular scope. This is something called a MILDOT scope, which is something that I'm very familiar with. Let's go over it real quick. Now behind me you'll see a simulated image through a mil dot scope and the characteristics of a mil dot scope is that you have a crosshair and then you have these dots. They're called mil dots. The distance between those dots is 3.6 minutes of angle. That's one mil. Now the reason we use this particular measurement is that at 1,000 yards the distance between each of those dots is three feet. At 1,000 meters the distance between them is one meter. Now you can use any sort of a crosshair or even a post to aim a telescopic sight. The reason that we use mil dot scopes is that it allows us to estimate range without having to use another piece of equipment. We can just look straight through the scope and we can estimate a range. So out here we see a group of men standing around. They're probably up to something harmless. Maybe they're on their way to church. However, we would like to know how far away they are. So let's take this high value innocent bystander in the middle here and assume that he's approximately six feet tall. Perhaps in our briefing, we would know exactly how tall he was, but we're gonna use six feet to make it easy. Now, if you look at his mill dot, we have the scope centered on the top of his head and we go down one, two, three, four dots and we get to the ground at his feet. Now, at six feet, his height should be two mil dots at 1,000 yards. We find that his height is actually four mil dots at an unknown distance. However, we have a very simple formula for figuring that out. We simply take the expected number of mil dots for his height, which is two, divide it by his actual number of mil dots, which is four, and multiply that by 1,000 yards. So these folks are 500 yards away. Now, how does this work? We use something called angular size. Now, angular size is not a triangle. It's not a polygon of any kind. It is the intersection of two rays. We have a ray that goes from our eye to his feet, and we have a ray that goes from our eye to the top of his head. And what we use the mill dots for is simply to find the angle we know that it's four mils. Now, for those of you that are curious, we can also describe this as 14.4 minutes of angle, or just under one quarter of a degree. This is just one example of us using angular size to be able to estimate the distance between us and a target. Now, we don't necessarily have to use his height. We can use other objects in the field of view that can give us a height. For example, what's the distance between the top of the receiver and the bottom of a magazine on an AK-47? How long is an AK-47? What is the diameter of the tires on the Russian equivalent of a two and a half ton truck? How wide is a particular model of tank? These are all things that we can use in our visual field to help estimate a distance to a target. Now, another example of using the angular size of something to get a range would be this hunting scope for deer. If you look at those bars below the main crosshair, you'll see a couple of things. They get progressively shorter and they have ranges next to them. The way this scope is used is that you take the length of the deer's body and try and match it to the length of that bar. And when you do, it not only gives you the range, it gives you the amount of elevation you need to put on the target in order to hit it. Now, just for completeness sake, let's look at a Soviet style scope used on the Dragunov. Now, you'll notice here that you have 1.7 meters. That's the average height of a man. So what you do is you take that horizontal line 
you place that at their feet. And then you move the scope to the side until their head just touches that dotted curved line. And then that would give you the range to the target. Then all you have to do is you dial the range in meters into the scope and you aim dead on, which is the small triangle between the two 10 marks at the top. Once you get out to a thousand yards, you start using the small triangles beneath it. The first one is 1100, the second is 12, and the third is the maximum range of the Dragunov, which is 1300 meters. Again, what we're using here is angular size to estimate distance. But enough of that, let's get on to the sextant. So say you're sitting right here with your sextant on your ship and you look out and you see a spot on the horizon right here. And then what you do is you look up with your sextant until you see this star. What the sextant will measure is that angle right there. It doesn't know how high your boat is. It doesn't know what the refraction is. It doesn't know what the curve of the earth is and it doesn't know the height of the star. All it knows, you're going to see an angular size of 30 degrees. Now I drew this in a particular way because I want to make a point. I think it's pretty clear that no matter who you're talking to, be it somebody that's trying to explain the proper use of a sextant to you or a science denier, they're going to agree that your visible horizon is going to be a lot closer than that star. So this is what we're dealing with. There's no triangle here. We have two lines. We have a line going to the horizon, actually a ray, and a ray going to the star. We don't know how long those rays are, whether they're curvy or anything else. All the sextant will tell us is this angle right here. So here's my question for all those flat earth geniuses out there. Nathan, quantum eraser. Would you kindly tell me which of those rays is the adjacent? Is it the one on top or is it the one on bottom? Does it make a difference if I do this? Now, which one's the adjacent? Adjacent and opposite sides only come into play when you're dealing with a triangle because you have an adjacent and an opposite side and a hypotenuse. We don't have a hypotenuse here. We don't have an adjacent side and we don't have an opposite side. If you want to make an opposite side, right here, you're going to have to tell me how long that side is and how far away it is, because you got to complete the sides. All I'm interested in is that angle right there. So your entire argument about the bendy adjacent depends on you having a triangle. I'm not giving you that triangle. I'm just giving you that one angle. So in the future, let's drop the bendy adjacent crap. Talk about the angle, because that's what we're dealing with. And with a sextant, all we're doing is measuring that angle, and that angle alone. And that tells me the angular distance between that object, the horizon, and that object, which is the star that I'm looking at, or the light in the sky, as you like to say. So unless you want to tell me how long that side is and how much of that side is missing, don't bother talking to me about bendy adjacent. Not even going to bother with it. Now, when using a bubble sextant, such as this Link A12, we're not even measuring to the horizon. We're measuring from the zenith down to our celestial object. That angle still gives us the angular distance between the zenith and the celestial object. That is our HS reading, which is the raw reading on the sextant. From that, we apply our correction. And with a bubble sextant, the only correction that we have to make is for refraction. There is no refraction at the zenith. And at 45 degrees, the refraction is only about three minutes of angle. If we didn't include refraction in any way, shape, or form, we would only be three nautical miles off our position. But we like to do that for accuracy's sake. Now, when using a standard nautical sextant, such as this Davis Mark 25, we do have to do some corrections with our raw reading off of the sextant. Like the bubble sextant, we need to apply a refraction correction to our celestial object. And again, at 45 degrees above the horizon, that would be about three minutes of angle. If we didn't do it, we'd only be three nautical miles off. But we also have a horizon correction that we need to make. And that gets us from looking down at the spot on the horizon 
to getting an angle that is exactly perpendicular to our zenith. And that's called the dip correction. There are three components to the dip correction. We deal with refraction, we deal with our height above the surface of the water, and we deal with the curvature of the earth. The dip correction corrects for all three, and that brings us to a horizontal 90 degrees to the vertical at our point of observation. We use the angle to a celestial object corrected for refraction, and we use the horizontal to our position, which is derived from our horizon sighting with the dip correction. That gives us two rays and an angular size. And that is what the sextant does. For those of you that are curious, I have sextants. Do you, Quantum Eraser? How about you, Nathan Oakley? Brian's Logic? Mitchell? Do any of you even own a sextant? If I gave you a sextant reading from solar noon on a date and a location of my choice, could you tell me where I took it? I don't think you can, because you don't have the first clue how to use a sextant or what you're talking about when you say the sextant proves the flat earth. So once again, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan, destroying the flat earth one video at a time. Thank you all very much for your support of this channel with your subscriptions, your Patreons, your memberships, and even the occasional PayPal. My next project is to purchase a Precision Astrolab, and with your support, I should be able to get that within the month. So until next time, take care.